never involved in mission all my life until God missed time. I began to understand God's mind regarding mission. And I began to repent all over again. When I was ordained 21 years ago, I was serving in the cathedral. We used to have a young lady in our um, prayer group in the church. And we used to pray. She was a young, young graduate and we were praying for her to get a job. And then she got a job in the bank. We thought it was a major breakthrough. Her aged mother had struggled to see her through school. So she graduated as a banker. She started this work. We were excited. Six months after, she came to me. I was the chaplain of FHAC and chaplain of the prayer group. Leader of the prayer group, in fact. And she told me the Lord was calling her to the mission field. I thought it was the most stupid thing anyone had ever said to me. I thought it was the most, I mean, uh, I knew she had an aged, aged, aging mother. She had sibling and we had got this breakthrough she got a job in the bank. I thought it was the most stupid thing anyone ever said to me. Anyway, reluctantly I prayed for her and released her to the mission field. And um, six months after, she came to visit us looking really skinny. I mean, I endeavored ceremonially to mobilize some help for her to go to the mission field. And when she came back six months after, I was even more angry that she got a lucrative job and she lost it uh, because God said to her to go to the mission field. I thank God I have repented both of that feeling and the attitude and posture. Um, I have ever since been looking out for her to apologize to her for my attitude to her response to the sovereign will of God. I have repented. When I arrived in the mission field, the Lord Jesus actually appeared to me a few times and said to me, if I am Lord as I know that I am Lord and as the church professes that I am Lord, then anyone who does not serve me will go to hell. Do you know, I used to think of uh, repentance as something you just do on your own and it paves the way for heaven for you. Until I began to study the mantra in the book of Exodus. God, the Lord said to Moses, Say to Pharaoh, Let my people go that they may serve me. I have studied the Hebrew language. I have also taught it for about 22 years now. I have realized that between the Hebrew verb to, that means to worship and the Hebrew verb that means to serve, there is no dividing line. It's only among the Hebrews that there's no dividing line between worshipping God and serving God. So that expression translated, let my people go that they may serve me. Could have been translated, let my people go that they may worship me. I also noticed that some versions are at a loss between those meanings. So, but the vital nerve center of it is that number one, you cannot worship God and not serve him. That is hypocrisy. And you cannot serve God if you are not truly worshipping him. I notice that a great, the greater proportion of the people that go to church believe they are worshipping God and they have no business serving him. I pray that at this meeting you will repent. I pray so. Because many people will 
the church. You know, you know. J Jesus said, "Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I have commanded?" That's that's stupidity. That's that's the climax of hypocrisy. You call me Lord, and you care nothing what I have commanded. Why do you call me Lord? As a matter of fact, I was coming back to that expression, let my people go that they may serve me. Jesus said to me, the only way anybody can be truly free, liberated, because the Hebrew expression that means let my people go that they may serve me, actually means set my people free so that they can serve me and worship me. The only way anybody can be truly free on this earth is that he is both worshipping the Lord and serving the Lord. Anybody who is who thinks he is worshipping the Lord and not serving the Lord is not only a hypocrite, such a person is in bondage. The person is in crisis. The person is not existing in God's program. I will show you in detail. Do you understand? So we have got a lot of repentance. You know, uh, our second collect for, for grace, Almighty God, um, the author of life, giver of life and uh, the author of life and giver of the giver of life and author of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom. That expression actually means in whose service there exists perfect freedom. Anybody who is not serving God is in bondage. Such a person is a hypocrite. The person does not exist in the program of God. It will be shocking what people will witness on the day of judgment. It will be shocking. Many people will say, ah, but we are active in the Lord. Jesus will say, I don't know you. You do not exist in my plan. So we have got a lot of repenting to do. And in this first segment, I will show us a few things in the scripture. And we will take some time and repent. So that we shall be properly and effectively and functionally and actively attuned to the business of the master. The business of mission. Praise the Lord. I want to very effectively thank our Lord Bishop of Wari Diocese, Right Reverend Chris Ide. I know him for giving his support to things that will move the church forward. And right now we are on the threshold of total eclipse of the church. So we don't have we don't have an option anymore. I have lived in Europe where the church has literally collapsed. Uh, our daddy was talking about the conference we held, a Church of Nigeria conference on mission we held in Aba. And I remembered on the concluding note of my presentation, I said that if care is not taken, in the next 10 years, people will be hearing stories that there used to be churches in Nigeria. It would be a mere story. And when we finished, someone accosted me and let me out from the desk and said, you are talking about the next 10 years. If care is not taken, before the completion of four years of Buhari administration, there may not be church anymore in Nigeria. I travel a lot to northern Nigeria to minister. Next week, I will be going to Kapanchan. We will be going to Kapanchan for a mission. Part of the mission is to investigate areas where Fulani headsmen have literally cut down human beings like grass. And you don't hear it in the news anymore because part of the, part of the operation of this dispensation 
is to muscle up information so that you don't get to know what is happening in this country. And um, gradually the whole country is getting overrun by the ground forces of Islam. So if care is not taken, I mean it sounds like a fairy tale. I have, I, I have continued to go to the north even at the peak of Boko Haram bombing. At the peak of Boko Haram bombing, I entered into a covenant with God and I said, I will never counsel my regular ministration in the north because of Boko Haram. I entered into a covenant with God. People were calling me on the phone and saying, what is God saying about Boko Haram bombing? What is God saying? And I went on to God in prayer. And I said, God, what are you actually saying at Boko Haram Bombay? He said, is it really your business? All you should, all you need to know is that everywhere you are is connected to heaven and is connected to hell. So everywhere you are going, pack your bag with you in case you have to travel from there. And that has remained my attitude. You know now that Boko Haram is not only a matter for the north, but it's is gradually overtaking the entire country. It is a deal that has been planned for over in, in fact in, in successive segments. The last segment planned for over 35 years. In successive segments they are gradually being implemented. It's only the, the church that has no plan. By the way part of what the Lord began to say to me is that we have missed the privilege we had to evangelize the north and we are reaping of faith. We have also missed the privilege we have to effectively evangelize our environment and we are reaping the disaster of faith. I was in Britain in the early 1990s. At that time, in the early 1990s, the official Christian population was 2 million. In a country in the early 1990s rated at a population of 55 million. Official Christian population in the heartland, Christian heartland of Europe. Official Christian population was, was 2 million. Official Christian growth rate of Britain in the early 1990s was estimated at between 0.2 and 0.5%. In fact, to say that it was a growth rate was an understatement because Christianity was really not growing in Britain. In the early 1990s, Muslim population, official Muslim population was 1.5 million. And then it was usual to match the populations of the Hindus, the Sikhs, the Baha'i faith, and the indigenous religion. And it was put at between 300,000 and 600,000. But this, the frightening thing was that as at the early 1990s, the Islamic official growth rate in, in Britain, it was believed that Islam was doubling its population every year. Doubling its population. So some would say Islam had a population growth rate of 55%. Or some would say 100% depending on which authorities you wanted to believe. But at least the lowest Islamic population growth rate figure I read was 55%. At a time when official Christian growth rate in the heartland of Europe was zero, between 0 0.2 and 0.5%. So it was very clear that by simple mathematical index, Islam in the next couple of years was going to overrun Christianity and that's exactly what has happened so if you, if you even put all the jihadist uh, sensational activities aside Islam would naturally take over the whole of Europe naturally take over the whole of Europe and that is what has happened in most metropolitan counties in Britain Islam would win an election smoothly and safely without violence. And of course, some metropolitan counties in Europe, in Britain, 
are now headed by Muslims. Neatly, not by any GBT, not by any magumago, not by any fraud, but on a natural premise of simple population index. That is how we stand. So you will understand the crisis that we are faced with when we begin to unveil the issues of mission. And it is important that we look at structures, look at functional operations, look at our internal dispositions, look at our internal operations, modes of operation, look at our operational priorities, and be able to effectively explain the crisis that we are faced with. I was talking about Boko Haram and the northern churches. And uh, I, I said that I have been traveling to the north and I've, I keep traveling to the north. I will keep holding crusades in northern Nigeria until Jesus comes. Um, uh, uh, El Rufai, Maman El Rufai, has uh, announced to Nigerians that you cannot preach in Kaduna anymore unless you have a duly certified government license. And uh, I know that it's only an indication. Two months after he announced it for Kaduna, 19 northern states adopted the same law and, and instituted the same law through their state assembly. So you cannot preach in 19 states of the federation unless you have a duly certified government license in a country that is still sufficiently secular by its constitution. And yet, where I live in Transekulu, Enugu, every five o'clock, somebody will mount to the rooftop and shout, Allah! Go over! And he does not have a government of Enugu certified license. And I cannot preach in the north unless the government gives me a license to preach. So we are coming closer and closer to it. But my worry, my sorrow is that it does not appear to us like anything is happening. That is exactly how in nations where the church has been thoroughly eclipsed, that's how it began. Gradually, gradually. And the church is then circled and eclipsed. There are many churches in northern Nigeria today and I can take you along and show you. Many of which in the last one year, one year and six months, we are sitting 4,500 worshippers in three services on a Sunday morning. But in the last couple of months, they have not opened for once. Our diocese in Medigree had 34 churches all of them with ministers today. In the last one year, the number of churches that have been opened to business in our the Anglican Diocese of Medigree is less than five. Many of the ministers have run away from the town. So you think the plan is not succeeding? It is effectively succeeding. God spoke to me. God said, you lost the privilege to evangelize them. And that's where the crisis begins. And you are harvesting your wasted years of wrong priorities and emphasis. People we are busy making money, building mansions, buying aircraft. When you have the list of the richest church ministers in the world, Nigerian church ministers come in before number five richest church ministers in the world. Nigerian church ministers come before number five. In the heartland of London where English people can hardly buy houses, I can show you houses owned by Nigerian church ministers. In a place where the church is running the risk of total eclipse. That is the crisis we are facing. So I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to sensitize you so that you will repent. Because we need to, listen, listen, listen to me, listen. God will not hear us unless we repent. 
as long as we are not in the business of the father God looks at us as rebels God does not hear rebels he does not hear the prayers of rebels born again filled with the Holy Ghost minding our individual businesses God does not hear the prayers of rebels the day we repent God will come back to the church I was I came into a church in Abuja to begin a crusade early morning on a Sunday as I was entering the church Jesus appeared to me weeping I have spent the previous night reading news of of massive bombings and lives wasted so I actually went to bed in Suru to wake up early Sunday morning to begin the crusade Jesus appeared to me that morning he said, he said to me do you, do you think that I am all together insensitive to the injuries of the church he said where, where the church is bruised I am wounded where the church weeps I am in sorrow and Jesus said to me you got to a point and you believed you could carry on on your own and I stepped aside to watch how far you could carry on on your own and he said to me how much I desire even now that the church comes back to me and then I will prove my power yet again in the church Boko Haram bombs have not become superior to Holy Ghost anointing it is just that the church is living in rebellion and God has stepped aside and is watching how far we can go. So this is an era of repentance. There is no solution to the crisis coming in this country except repentance. Do you understand? Genesis chapter 12 I will begin to read from verse 1. Genesis chapter 12 and I begin from verse 1. The Lord said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever causes you, I will cause. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Verse 4. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran and they set out for the land of Canaan they arrived there Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Mori at Shechem at that time the Canaanites were in the land the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your offspring I will give this land so he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued towards Negev. Number one, God is
is a missionary God. In every situation, in every circumstance, at every point in time, he is seeking to introduce himself to mankind. Number two, God is seeking human consent to operate upon the earth. God can only take any portion of land on earth that human beings give to him. There is a mistake Christians make in believing, you know, God is in total control. Anything he wants to do, he will do. That is true. But that is not true. God is not lawless. Now, God can do anything he wants to do. Can. Within the framework of ability. When we say can, the Greek verb dunatai refers to possessing an ability. But it takes more than an ability to do something. Do you understand? So when we say God can do all things, we imply that God possesses the ability to do all things. He has the capability for doing all things. But He cannot do all things. Because the will is a vital component of doing. You need to understand this theological position. Do you understand? I mean, if you are if you are the father of your house, you can do anything you like. Slap anybody dangerously. But some of you cannot slap your wife. Is it true or false? Does it mean you cannot slap her? Does it mean that? But some of you cannot slap your wife. True or false? True. You can slap her, but you cannot slap her. There are some of you who cannot, under any circumstance, slap your wife. So you need to understand, when we say can, when we say can, by linguistic perspective, two things are involved. If you say that God can do all things, in a sense, it, it is blasphemous. If you say God cannot do all things, in a sense, it's also blasphemous. You need to understand language. That is why we study language. If somebody says, you can do this man, he can do anything. This man, he can do this man. If somebody introduces you as somebody who can do anything, I will begin to fear you. <laughs> do you understand? This man, <laughs> this man, he can do anything. I will be afraid of you. Do you understand? God is not lawless. He can do all things. But he can't do all Listen. At the time God was creating the earth, Genesis chapter 1 in verse 26, the Bible, God said, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness and let him have dominion. The word translated dominion is from the Hebrew rodu, which means to have a total control. The word dominion actually was first seen in the Latin Vulgate version of the Bible. The Latin word dominus means Lord. God appointed human beings as Lord over the earth. Listen, listen now. Listen. If God wants to do anything on earth, he seeks the will and the operative force of human beings. That is where we Christians miss it. It is human beings that decide what happens on earth. Do you understand? Human beings decide. I, I wish I could take you from place to place in the scripture to tell you. Jacob was running away from his brother Esau. And he came to a certain place. And night befell him. The only thing available there were grasses and stones. He lay himself on a bunch of grasses and put a stone under his head as pillow and slept. But when he slept, his eyes were opened to the realms of the spirit. And he saw a ladder connecting that place to heaven. Meaning that wherever you are is actually connected to heaven if you are a child of God. Oh, and, uh, and, and, and Jacob said, oh my God, this, this, 
this God is here. I didn't even know it. He erected an altar in that place. He called the altar Bethel. Do you understand? Many, 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 many years after, Israel split into two. Many generations after, people had gone back and forth and back and forth. Finally, that land became the land of the Israelites. A man called Jeroboam the first, son of Nebat, took over that area as part of his kingdom with ten tribes. The Israelites were still coming from the north to worship in the south in Jerusalem. But after a time, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, said, No, I won't let the people continue to go to the south to worship. Otherwise, one day, their hearts will run over to the leadership of the south and they will desert me and go over to the south. He chose two strategic places to set up altars. One of the places was Dan. Another place was Beersheba. Beersheba actually is a segment in Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. It was Jacob who set up an altar in that area and he called it Bethel. If you are reading that place in Genesis 28, 29, 30, you will find out that shortly after Jacob called the place Bethel, God introduced himself as, as El Bethel. The God of Bethel. It was a human being who gave the land to God. God said to the human being, Thanks, sir. I now live here. Many years after, a king called Jeroboam went and set up altars in Dan and in Beersheba or Bethel. God did not bother himself about the altar in Dan if you study the Bible. But God was worried about the satanic altar in Bethel because somebody had given him Bethel. God sent a preacher, First Kings chapter 13. He said, go to the king there. Tell him that this land has been given to me. Let him take away his satanic altar from there because this land has been handed over to me. Meaning that it is human beings who give to God and God will inhabit Anywhere human beings don't give to God, God will not inhabit. Why? Because God has appointed human beings the Lord over the earth. That means that anything God will do on earth, He will seek the will and the operative capacity of human beings. Himself will supply the actuating force. In other words, if God wants to do any project on earth, He will make it appear like a human project. That is what the Apostle Paul was trying to explain in Philippians chapter 2 in verse 13 where he said, For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. In other words, if God wants to do anything on earth, he makes you to desire it. And then he makes you to go ahead to do it as if you are the one doing it. But he is the one wanting to do it. And in the final, in the final uh, analysis, he is the one supplying the operative force for doing it. But if there is no human will, it will not be done. God wants to rule the earth. I can tell you that one of the grand satanic operations over the planet earth is to take over the planet earth as satanic enclave and hoist a satanic leader, an antichrist leader over the earth. And that project is going on and Christians do nothing about it. The earth is in the process of being taken over by Satan. God is beating his chest and asking, where are my men? Where are my people? Where are they? They are busy doing business. Their own business. Point number two, Abraham's father was a Muslim. A worshipper of the moon god. By the way, the home, the native home of Abraham is in the awe of the Chaldeans. And, and the awe of the Chaldeans is the place we call presently Iraq. As a matter of fact, it will surprise you to know, if you have studied this Bible the way I have studied it, 
it will interest you to know that the homeland of Abraham is actually in Baghdad which is the native home of Saddam Hussein it will surprise you to know that Saddam Hussein is actually Abraham's distant relation so Abraham's homeland is still the homeland of the worship of the spirit of the moon if you read my book prayer manual for end time prophetic warfare I devoted one chapter to the spirit of the moon the manifestation of the spirit of the moon on earth today do you understand I don't want to uh, waste time in unnecessary things but uh, but God called Abraham out because he wanted to establish himself do you know that okay let me explain one or two things let me not um, let me not gloss over very important things in Genesis chapter 3 in Genesis chapter 1 God gave man authority over the ethereal plane the entire ethereal plane however the devil has studied the nature of this authority that human beings are carrying and he found out that it is a delegated authority the authority human beings have over the earth is authority proceeding from God which is authority based upon recognition of divine authority in other words you are an authoritative being as long as you honor and respect the authority of God I told you at the beginning that God does not hear the prayers of rebels in fact it is easier for somebody to do the will of God doing the will of God is prayer in itself praying and not doing the will of God is escalated the rebellion the authority we carry is the authority that issues from God it is effective as long as we are under the authority of God what does it mean to be under the authority of God to do the will of the master do you understand hallelujah John 14 verse 15 John 15 verse 14 you are my friends if you do what I command he that does what I command he, he is the one that loves me in fact if you read John chapter 14 from verse 19 to verse 21 he that loves me will be loved of my father and and we shall manifest ourselves to him and Judas not Iscariot asked him how do you mean manifest the word translated manifest is the Greek verb that means to shine light Many people are not doing well in their lives because they are living in a rebellion. How do you mean manifest yourself to him to, to, to us? Jesus replied, He said, If anyone loves me, my father will love him, and then I and my father will come into him and make our dwelling in him. Make our dwelling. Isaiah 54 verse 17 No weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper and every tongue that shall arise against you in judgment thou shalt condemn Many people like to stop there They don't read the next part which says This is the heritage of the servants of God Avadim Avadim There are two words you find in this in the old testament one of them is avadim servants the other one is hesedim 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 holy ones chosen ones the chosen people of god they mean the same thing this is the heritage of the servants of the lord their righteousness is of me says the lord do you understand there are promises written down for servants. The people that do the will of God. Hallelujah. 
So, God called Abraham out from the worship of the moon. And Abraham proceeded to follow the Lord. There were three strategic people that followed Abraham. One of them was Lot. The other one was Sarah, his wife. The Bible did not mention the third personality until Genesis chapter 16. But Abraham obeyed God and made a move. And the Bible said God appeared to him. And God swore to him and said, Unto your offsprings I will give this land. What was God doing? He was establishing the worship of the Lord Most High. That's why, if you notice, at every point in time, the Bible will say, and he erected an altar there. Your primary business is to make the will of God known anywhere you are. Anywhere. And everywhere. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 15. God appeared again to Abraham and said, Walk before me and be blameless. Then if you're reading the lines properly, then I will be number one, your shield. Number two, and your exceeding great reward. You know, we are in the prosperity era. We are able to put prosperity verses in the scripture. But God has a prosperity plan. Walk before me and be blameless. Then, number one, I will be your shield. That means your protection. Number two, I will be your exceeding great reward. Many ministries are now running away from the north and they are running towards the south. Because they think that the south is safe because they don't know what the plan is. Have you realized that the greater concentration of the operations of the Fulani headsmen is now in the middle belt? They have now overrun, technically overrun the major parts, the core parts of the north, even in areas where you have Christian settling. I visit the north regularly. I confer regularly with northern ministers. I partner with northern ministries. Nigeria is gradually forming itself into a new shape. You hear of internally displaced persons. Do you hear that, that expression? Many of the internally displaced persons in the north will never get back home. Never. They will never get back home. Why? The omen called the internally displaced persons is a new geographical posture and disposition that is forming in Nigeria. New geographical position. Let me alert you ahead of time that the final struggle over Nigeria will be in the middle belt. When the struggle over the middle belt, whichever way is turn, it turns, I'm saying this so that you can read the Nigerian map and calendar. Whichever way the struggle over the middle belt turns, that will determine, determine the future of Nigeria in the next three, four, five years. Listen to me. If by any chance you hear that the middle belt is overrun, 80% of the Islamization plan in Nigeria has been completed. 
80 percent the other bit will just be a smooth walkover i will show you how and why it is so in genesis chapter 16 a new personality emerged in the abrahamic journey that is the personality called hagar hagar was an egyptian and she was a muslim now actually when we talk about spirit when we talk about when we talk about religious organizations we are talking about spirits all of the chaldeans is actually in babylon and like i said the present location of all of the chaldeans or babylon is the present day iraq iraq was actually put together by britain as it is presently composed it was put together by britain in 1911 how did they how did it happen it was by bringing together the courts of the north and the sunnis in the south and joining them with central baghdad and then establishing the authority under islam britain did that to establish a world power in the persian gulf just like they formed nigeria to establish a world power in africa a world power british colony so from 1911 until the later part of the 1960s um, or 1940s 1950 depending on which authority you have you are citing iraq remained a british colony just like from 1914 until 1960 nigeria remained a british colony these were enclaves formulated for political and economic reasons but anyway these enclaves are becoming domains of power in the world now you would have noticed okay recently recently the the shiites of Iran nearly came for war in northern Nigeria. You heard that the chief of army staff in Nigeria had uh, a crisis with the a, with a Muslim sect in northern Nigeria and a large number of them were slaughtered and Iran was warming up to come for a major conf military confrontation in Nigeria. Well, I think some authorities intervened and halted that but um, but anyway when we talk about religious groups you should be conscious of the spirits behind them it is not for instance you may say that Islam started when Muhammad was Muhammad simply popularized the spirit called Islam Muhammad was born about 570 AD he simply popularized the spirit called Islam. Now, somebody cannot say that Jesus Christ started the worship of God. I mean, that's with you, that, that Christianity only started 2,000 years ago. But the spirit behind Christianity has been in existence before creation, true or false? True. So if the spirit behind Christianity has been in existence before creation, and that same spirit has had adherents. Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were worshippers of the same God of Christianity. Is it true or false? True. So the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, is our God true or false? True. So Christianity did not start 2,000 years ago. Do you understand? Because the spirit of Christianity has been in existence. And the personality the personalities adhering to that spirit have also been in existence. So how can we say Christianity started 2,000 years ago? So in the same way, you cannot say that Islam started in 6th century AD. Because the spirit called Islam has been on earth and has been searching for adherence. In Genesis chapter 16, Sarah took Abraham, Sarai actually, took her maid called Hagar who was a Muslim who was actually the personification of the Muslim spirit and gave her 
to Abraham and said, Sleep with her. Abraham slept with her and gave birth to a child called Ishmael. For your information, the word Ishmael means man of God. And so the first seed of Abraham was released in this man called Ishmael, who was actually in personhood the blood of Abraham but in spirit of the spirit of his lamb and from that day God has been in crisis because every time God looked at Abraham, looked at Ishmael he saw Abraham but then the spirit in Ishmael is the spirit of his lamb so the crisis started from there and it has not entered, ended until now. If you notice, in Genesis chapter 16, when Hagar was pregnant, she actually ran away from her mistress. The angel of the Lord knew that a crisis was already being produced. The angel of God went and met Hagar and said, where are you going? Hagar said, I am running away from my mistress. The Spirit of God said, the angel of God said, please go back to your mistress. Why? Because Hagar was carrying a dangerous bomb. For the only hope that existed was that this Ishmael would be born into the household of Abraham and be nurtured in the faith of Abraham. Do you understand? A mistake had been made. But God believed that it could be corrected. Christians always believe that God can do everything. It is true. But it is not true. There are things God has appointed to human beings. Listen to me. God cannot do what he has appointed unto human beings to do. Because number one, he is not a lawless God. God was hoping that although a mistake had been made, this mistake could have been corrected. And this mistake could actually have been corrected if Ishmael was not charred in the faith of Abraham. That is Christian discipleship. But unfortunately, Christians are not good at nurturing. Christians are not good. Every time, listen, one day the Lord was speaking to me. He was sharing with me the crisis of the one Muslim escapee. The one infidel escapee. Whenever one infidel, one unbeliever, misses the chance of being discipled, several thousands of unbelievers are created to the detriment of the business of God on earth. It was the same Hagar. Finally, finally, Ishmael was born and it was as if Hagar was puffed up. Finally again, Isaac was born. When you get him, study Genesis chapter 16, chapter 17. There are a number of things you will discover. Number one, it was unto Ishmael that God first released the blessing of prosperity. This blessing of the prosperity of Ishmael is still working all over the world. It is very painful, but it is true. Very painful, but true. Genesis chapter 16, verse 11. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child and you will have a son you shall name him Ishmael meaning man of God for the Lord has heard of your misery he will be a wild donkey of a man his hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. But the angel the angel said 
to her go back go back the angel found Hagar verse 7 near a spring in the desert it was a spring that is beside the road of Shur he said Hagar servant of Sarai where have you come from and where are you going I am running away from my mistress Sarai answered Sarai she answered the angel of the Lord told her go back to your mistress and submit to her the angel added I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count when we talk about the descendants of Ishmael we are talking about Iran Iraq, Kuwait Bahrain, Turkey Jordan um, Dubai these are the most beautiful nations of the world can I tell you that 85% of all the crude oil deposits in the world are controlled by the Ishmaelite nations 85% So when God says, I will bless, I will bless. So what if Ishmael was not charged? Now we are coming closer to the issues of mission and Christian nurturing. Because actually, mission properly understood is the nurturing of the world around us unto our faith. It is a serious work. It is a tasking responsibility. It is the primary responsibility. Nothing else should take preeminence over it. Assiduously turning the world around us unto God. I met a man who is a native doctor. And I was ministering to him. I said to him, I see you carrying a Bible and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He laughed and laughed and laughed. After laughing, he said, ah, that, he said, if I would have repented, I would have repented when I was living with the bishop. He said, I lived with the bishop for 10 years. And I left his house voluntarily. When he turned, I went away. I was in a pensive, sober, sorrowful mood. How can a man live with a bishop for ten years and end up a native doctor? I can easily tell it. We don't have an attitude of nurturing. It is not our business. We don't take it as a responsibility. It is not our business. We travel around the world for business. But nurturing people onto our faith is not our business. I was a student in Huddersfield, West Yorkshire, England. Every Sunday, I used to go to church. I used to worship in St. Barnabas Anglican Church. Um, you know. And, uh, you know, and um, you would get into the church the person that introduced me to the church was a young lady called Lucy from, from St. Lucia. Uh, you know. And um, when we got into the church, we, I was drifting to the end of the church. She said to me, Emmanuel, you don't have to bother. Because as long as you sit on that chair being a black person, no white person would sit on that chair with you. The white person would bother. And it was true. So, so I sat on one. She said to me that whenever she came to the church, she would sit on one chair all by herself. Nobody will bother sitting in, on any chair around her because she is black. She said to me, I should balance on one full chair. They would go and cluster around other chairs and greet themselves. Oh, how, how are you doing? Oh, good to see you. How are you doing? Good to see you. One, one, the Hindus, 
used to worship on Thursdays or Saturdays. And our students used to go to the Hindu chapel to worship. The chapel, the worship used to last three hours. At the end of the worship, their Hindu white friends would drive them home in their cars. Open their boots and bring out presents and give them. And give them 1,000 pounds gift for worshipping in the Hindu chapel. I was paying 31 pounds every week in the hostel where I was living. 1,000 pounds would have made a lot of difference to me. One day I said to myself, God, I, sorry, I, I will apologize to you. I, I want to go and worship in the Hindu chapel. I want to feel at home myself. I mean, how? I mean, what's the, what's, the, what's, what, what's the sense that I go to the church to worship and I sit on a chair? My fellow worshippers cannot as much as share the same seat with me. And I see my fellow students go to worship in a Hindu chapel. And I see their white friends drive them home in a car. Lavish presents on them. Why should I be worshipping? I could have been earning 1,000 pounds every Thursday. I will close my eyes and say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Oh, it's, it is a situation. Do you understand? We don't have an attitude of nurturing. Now, when Isaac was born, Sarai became jealous of Ishmael because Ishmael was the firstborn. It was Sarai that established the doctrine of cast out the bond woman. Sarai established that doctrine. From that day until now, we have had that orientation. Cast out the bond woman. Chase the bed. Anybody we cannot manage, throw the person away. Many of the people that have been thrown away like that have always turned out against the church. How many will I name? I don't have time for empty storytelling. Karl Marx was a Christian. His father was a dutiful member of the church. Very active member of the church. Karl Marx, in the early days of his life, was an active member of the church. One day he had a misunderstanding with his father. The reverend father came to their house. His father complained to the reverend father that the boy disobeyed him. The reverend father said to Karl Marx's father, if your son disobeys you, lay him on the chair and give him 24 strokes of the cane so that he will learn his lesson. And his father did that to Karl Marx. That was the last time Karl Marx went to the church. If you read Karl Marx's ideas of the communist philosophy, you will see that it has nothing to do with atheism. Karl Marx brought in atheism side by side with his communist philosophy when they have nothing in common with each other. As a matter of fact, if you study communism, communism first existed in the church. Genesis chapter 4. The people had everything in common and no one claimed that everything, anything belonged to him. And they shared the things together according as each man had need. That is the principle of the communist philosophy. As a principle. It is in the Bible. Communism is not about atheism. Karl Marx personally hated the God that his father was worshipping. Because of the principle of cast out the bond woman. From that day until now. It has remained the system of the church. For your information, if you repent from Islam, they will follow you with all kind of, kinds of negotiation. If they cannot win you back, they will kill you. If you turn away from Hinduism, they will not kill you, but they will follow you with immense love until they have won you back. If you turn away from most occult groups, they will follow you diligently with love. It 
it's only in Christianity that if somebody stops coming to church, nobody bothers it. So, so the business of mission is basically the business of discipling our environment in our faith. We're talking about discipling and our, our environment, and yet some people have not discipled their household in the faith. Why are some people unable to disciple their household? It is because they themselves are not sufficiently Christian to impart their household. You live in a Christian home and it is a free for all worldly home. What Christian virtue does your home have to give to anybody growing up in it? Absolutely nothing. Nothing Christian. What are the Christian elements of your home? Absolutely nothing. That's where the crisis is. Come to think of it. Islam is one of the most committed religions in the world. While I lived in Huddersfield, the maximum attendance of our church St. Barnabas Church was probably seven. On the day we had um, we had harvest and giving service, the population increased to eleven. The vicar was so excited. Oh, the church is so full today. It's so full today. And what was our Thanksgiving service? Each person had one apple for Thanksgiving. One apple. Oh, it's time to bring our Thanksgiving to God. And we were taking one apple to the altar. When the church has backslidden, every of its suppressions will turn into a ceremony. That is how the church begins to die. In the same, in the same, in the same Britain, Islam was building a mega mosque that was going to seat 41,000 people, 41,000 mega mosque. And they were building it in central London, directly opposite the National Stadium. Mega mosque. Why? Islam is a committed organization. Even without the forceful operations of the jihadists, Islam will naturally take over the world by sheer commitment. I don't know who bewitched us, but what do we still have? We don't have regular hours of prayer. We don't have a genuine attitude to prayer. We don't have any genuine spiritual attitude that is evident. I was traveling back from Isikwa to Enugu one late night, 9 p.m. I was coming to the roadblock. All the army officers were squatting on the ground and praying 9 p.m. in the night. They were squatting on the ground and prayed. They kept everything, every security instrument, squatted on the ground, fully kitted in their uniform. But for that moment of prayer, they kept everything down, squatted on the ground, and we are eating their heads on the ground. I just came to the place, flashed the light, saw where they were clustered on the ground and prayed. Tears filled my eyes. I said, who has bewitched us? Who has bewitched us? What do we still have as evidence of faith? Nothing. What we are experiencing is evidence of gradual death. Christianity will obviously die in our hearts before it dies in our environment. The evidence we are seeing is that it has clearly died in our hearts. The next thing that we follow is that its ceremonial nuances will eventually die. What do I mean? When somebody is no longer holding tenaciously to anything, his grip 
has collapsed. He will obviously lose that thing at the slightest confrontation. What do we still have as evidence of our faith? Nothing. Muslims accuse Christians of destroying the world. A drama happened in a bank in Kaduna. A young lady came to the bank almost completely naked. Her skirt was just a little beyond the junction of her two legs. And a Muslim, Muslim woman came to the bank fully covered up as a decent woman. She was sitting at one corner. At a point, she couldn't endure this anymore. She walked straight to the girl and said, Cost is the day you were born. Cost is the mother that raised you. You are a cost to womanhood. The girl was pulling down her skirt, pulling, holding her like this. The woman said, you are a cost to motherhood. You are a cost to, to motherhood. You are a cost to womanhood. The woman that raised you up as a woman is cost all her life. People we are watching. She was poor. She was weeping as she was saying it. I feel ashamed to be associated in womanhood with you. You are a total disgrace to womanhood. She was pouring out. Pouring. She was weeping. Other people came and started holding her. Holding her. She was in sorrow. If you were there, you would have been caught up in her sorrow. Muslims believe that Christians are destroying the world. They believe that Christians have no faith. They have no religion. They have no belief. They have no decency of life. What do we still have as evidence of our faith? Have we not backslidden? Bunch of modern backsliders. That's what we are. The day we repent, God will come back to us. I was traveling with a pastor to East Africa, um, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And when we got to Addis Ababa, we were to go on, on an exchange aircraft. And that aircraft was going to arrive at Addis Ababa airport in six hours time. It was already late evening. So we, we were quarantined in Addis Ababa airport for six hours. We asked if we could go into Addis Ababa and look around, maybe buy a few things. And we were told that if we didn't have visa to Addis Ababa, we could be arrested in Addis Ababa. Of course, our visa read Tanzania, so we had no business entering Addis Ababa. So my friend and I were moving around the, um, the airport, and we came to a room designated prayer room. And we said, why not? This is the prayer room. Let's go in and pray. And we went in there and started praying. It was already late evening. It must have been around 8 o'clock or so. And we were praying until quarter to nine. By quarter to nine, people started streaming into the place. They were Muslims. They were cleaning themselves up in preparation for prayer from quarter to nine. By the time it was nine o'clock, every inch of space in that prayer room had been taken up. My friend looked, opened his eyes and looked at me. I opened my eyes and looked at him. We gave each other a sign and we went out of the place. As we were going out from the place, we were asking ourselves, but aren't these other travelers also Christians? And this place did not say Muslim prayer place or Christian prayer place. Simply says prayer room. The only people who pray are Muslims. So let's begin to get to the issue as it affects mission. Point number one. We are now thinking of doing mission as a program. Islam does mission as life. Do you understand? Let me give, let me cite instances. 
in one church in our nature one aboki was employed as gate man and there uh, every time you know you speak english to him you say bad bad trenchy bad trenchy that i don't understand english one day a lawyer came to visit the church and he saw this aboki man and hugged him they were excited they hugged each other and they were conversing you know and then the man eventually went in and saw the overseer of the church and as they were coming out the yaboki was at the gate and the man was telling the yaboki was taking the overseer ah, this is my friend in, we, were to, we were together in the law school you know it's my friend and, ah, what is he actually doing here and the man said this one with you in the law school said, oh, yes. we graduated together we were called to bar the same day Say this one called to bar and they called the man say come here you told me that uh, you're bad to you. you don't understand English the man was said, ah. he said but, uh, but we were chatting, chatting a while ago and then they went into his room in the security booth and they began to search the place they were shocked at what they discovered because they discovered many electronic gadgets that the young man had been using to convey information to Jamaat al, al-, al- Muslimi, whatever they call it, JMI, whatever they call it. And the shock was unbearable. The young man was a commissioned barrister and solicitor and advocate of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. But for the sake of his faith, he came that low. That is mission. That is mission. For them, mission is life. Mission is not something that you do occasionally. You know, no, sir. Mission is life. It takes the whole being. And it is so because that is supreme obedience to the supreme command of Allah. Listen to me. It will take us ages to transit from mission as a program to mission as life. It will take us ages. I serve in the missionary diocese. I thank God I had a privilege to serve in a missionary diocese. I thank God for the privilege. You serve in a place where there is no light, no portable water, and you survive in the place one year, two years, three years, four years. It, it is a privilege. It is a privilege. It will take us ages to transit from mission as a ceremonial program to mission as life. The place where I presently serve is the kind of place where ordinarily if you posted a priest, he will spend all his life lamenting his heart out. Even lament unto the congregation in place of his Sunday sermons. His Sunday sermons will be lamentation to the congregation and deliberate abuse. You know, you know that I'm not your level, I'm not your match. If not that the I have already the bishop. What would have brought me to this level? I don't blame you. I'm only here on punishment. Someday the punishment will cease. So it will take us ages. Somebody who looks at service to faith to God and fellow human beings as mere punishment. A priest was telling me that this is the sixth year of serving a sentence. Is is sentence in a school chapel. Seven, the seventh year of serving his prison sentence in a school chapel. So think about it. What it means to walk in the midst of young people in the secondary school and have an opportunity to not shut their lives 
to sow indelible seed in their lives. That is what he interprets as serving his prison sentence. I have stopped complaining. Don't I have to stop complaining. Any day he pleases the big man, he will release me from the sentence, prison sentence. I've stopped complaining. I'm, I'm not in the good books. I know it. Any day he pleases them, they will release me from the prison. I will follow my colleagues to enjoy. What he, call, what he calls for his colleagues to enjoy is to serve in a big church and people will give him gifts and give him chicken. That is what he considers to you. So, it will take us ages to transit from mission as program to mission as life. And until we transit into mission as life, we are still in trouble. Serious trouble. God's heart is breaking. You know, just busy doing our business. And right around us, the enemy is taking over the terrain. I did not know. We, we were the ones that recorded the testimony of the young Boko Haram's youth secretary that Jesus arrested. How did Jesus arrest him? There is one young girl that kept, you know, inviting him to fellowship. And he was very bitter at that invitation. One day, he followed the girl, didn't know anything about him. One day, he followed the girl to the church. And when he got to the church, he was surveying the church because he wanted to teach the girl a lesson by the way he would send people to burn down the church. So he came to the church and was surveying the church, you know, looking at the different areas in the church, the points of entrance, the things he would pour fuel on and set them on fire. The minister was ministering. When he finished ministering, he made an altar call. The young man, Shwaibu is his name. He stood up. He didn't know what jacked him up. And the thing jacked him up and was pushing him towards the altar. He was trying to stop himself. He saw himself moving like this. You know? It was clear that he was struggling with something. The thing jacked him towards the altar and he knelt down and gave his life to Jesus. He went back home. When he got back home, he went into his room. He did not talk to anybody he was in a very pensive mood. His mother came in there and said, where did you go? He couldn't say a word. Where did you go? What happened to you? He couldn't say a word. The time he knew that something dangerous had happened to him was, it was his turn to announce the prayer time the next morning. According to him, if it is your turn to announce the prayer time, Allah Akbar, you will start that announcement is given at 5 o'clock but you will start at 3 o'clock in the morning to do preparation I was listening to his testimony and I was weeping you will start at 3 to start preparing yourself to be able to go to the restroom and shout Allah so at 3 he woke up and started the preparation a minute to 5 he went to the restroom he wanted to shout, Allah, Akbar. But what he saw himself saying was, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you are worthy. Uh -uh. The people rushed at him. And said, and I and I cry, you know. And he said, uh -uh. I am saying, Allah, Akbar. What he was hearing himself saying was, Allah, Akbar. But what other people were hearing was, Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, you are worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. They dragged him down from there. And they forced him to recant. He said, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm I don't know what people are saying. He went back inside his room. And he, whenever you opened his mouth to talk, the only thing that will come out was thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. His mother took him to all kinds of fasting and all kinds of occult ministration to break that 
victim that happened to him after he had been through it hallelujah after he had been through it he would open his mouth again and hear Allah Akbar and he would be hearing thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus that was how trouble started and they began to pursue him all over the place but the aspect of his testimony that hit me like rocket was that as a graduate with two university degrees they were all sleeping inside the bush for the sake of Allah they were all sleeping inside the bush and that was the minimum he could do for the sake of Allah hallelujah amen so when it comes to doing mission the actual implication is number one taking the gospel to the unreached unfortunately we have all around us millions of the unreached somebody took a study in Onisha and actually found out that the population of the people living in the entire space called the Diocese on the Niger is about one point over 1.5 million people and he wanted to calculate the population of the people called Diocese on the Niger Anglican Communion he wanted to do Yes, but he finished the tea. He took all the populations of the church. You know, we take our head count shortly before the sermon. And then, according to him, maybe another 10% of the people would come after the sermon. So he took his head count and added another 10%. And then he came to a clergy workshop. He was simply trying to mention to us that all we do in the church is celebrate ourselves and go about our business. And he asked the question, does any one of you have an idea how many people constitute a diocese on the Niger? Some we are giving all kinds of wild guesses, you know, funny guesses. And he said in a population of between 1.5 and 1.8 million people, the data available is that the number of Anglicans is around 50,000 people. 1, 1.8 10% of 1.8 million 1 over 10 assuming you share the population of the people in Niger Delta area by 10 1, 1, 10% of 1.8 million will be 180 80,000. If he took the lower figure, that would be 1.5 million. 1% 1 of 1.5 million is 150,000. So we are not even, we are even less than one third of 10%. What does one third of 10% mean? That is 10% divided by 3. 10% divided by 3. That is around 3%. 3% of the entire population of Diocese on the Niger is Anglican. 3% or 3.3% less than 4%. That is, what does it mean? What does 4% mean? It means 4 out of 100 people. That is what constitutes the Anglican population in Diocese on the Niger. If you take a similar survey of the Wari area, you will find out that the number of people we have in all our churches is four in 100 people on the street. What does it mean? It means we are simply celebrating ourselves and doing our business and joking away our time. We have a lot to repent of a great deal to begin to repent of. 
where does it begin? It begins with a renewed commitment to the master. A renewed commitment to the master. Lord, what would you have me do? Lord, what would you have me do? I have a friend who is an ophthalmologist in Kano. And I thank God all through the crisis in Kano, he has refused to leave Kano. Because of his expertise in eye problems, a large population of Muslims go to him. He is their personal doctor. He is admitted into their homes. And it is a privilege to reach them. And he reaches them. For your information, how suffering and me people are human beings. They are human beings like you. They only grow up to acquire certain orientations. They were not born with those orientations. The Christian community is a very uncaring community. That is why God is abandoning us. For your information, God is bitter with us. I went for a crusade in Afibu. My friend, the bishop, took me around Afibu, showed me most of the Muslim installations in Afibu. And I began to see their mode of operation. Islam has been in Afibu since 1946. Now, they have third and fourth generation of indigenous Afibu people who are Muslims. How do they do it? They have nursery education, primary education, secondary education, tertiary education, free of charge. Free of charge. When you finish secondary education in their institution, and of course they teach you the best, they have the best of teachers. They teach you all kinds of subjects, but in addition, they also teach you Islam. When you finish you can opt for the best universities in Saudi Arabia and in Dubai. Do you now know that the best universities in medicine all over the world are to be found in Dubai? Some of the best universities in medicine in the world are to be found in India. Free of charge. Free. Compare them with our schools. The number one thing you know that a school is a church school is that the school fees will be unaffordable. The best university in Nigeria, one of the best rated universities in Nigeria is a private university that belongs to a Pentecostal church. But that is the costliest university in the church. Even members of the church cannot afford to sponsor their children in the church. The pastor of that church is rated among the five richest pastors in the whole world. And yet, the Christian school is unaffordable. Christians are the most uncaring people in the whole world. So why are we fooling ourselves saying that we want to do mission? But anyway, in case we still want to do mission, we need to come down change our entire orientation to life and do what our master has asked us to do. We have no option. Do what our master has asked us to do. I was in my office in Unizik, Oka, and a student brought a form, scholarship form, to me, for me to fill it for him. It is Buba Marwa Educational Foundation Fund. That fund makes available to beneficiary students 250,000 naira every session. 250,000 naira can pay a student's university school fees, pay the hostel fees, and leave him with additional money. 
to take care of other needs. 250,000 naira. So I took time to study the form. And I studied this in detail because the young man wanted me to sign it. So I needed to study it. And I found out that once every year, the fund also provides for taking the students on holidays to Dubai or Saudi Arabia. And the form stipulates that the form must be signed by a clergyman. After I'd read through it to the end, I said to myself that they simply want me to sign this form and willfully donate a Christian student to Islam. So I said to the young man, what does your father do? He said, I have no father. What about your mother? I have no mother. I lost my parents in early childhood. How do you pay your school fees? Well, I stayed two weeks in school and two weeks out of school hustling for all kinds of jobs to be able to earn money to pay school fees. I said, Oga, if I sign this form, my conscience will not forgive me that I willfully donated you to Islam. I said, as my contribution, come to me every month. I will give you 10,000 naira out of my salary as my contribution to your school fees. 10,000 naira every month will amount to 120,000 naira. At least I was sure with that he could pay his official school fees in Unizig and uh, part, if not all, of his hostel fees. And I said, well, you could now hustle a little to take care of the others. He looked at me and he went away and I never saw him again. And one day I saw him in the compound. He probably didn't recognize me, but I had cause to believe that he had become a Muslim already. Many had become Muslims like that. Islam is a clean, committed organization. The church is the most uncaring organization I have ever seen. So why are we talking about mission? Somebody who does not have a caring heart cannot do mission. When are we going to translate from mission as a ceremonial program to mission as life? Life completely given over to a cause in fulfillment of the mandate of the master for the avoidance of doubt. Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and make disciples of me. It is a mandate he has given us. To obey him is to be disciples. To disobey him is to be rebels. Today, opportunities are closing up everywhere in the north. But there is one opportunity that will never close up. What we did not do many years ago will cost us a lot more money to do now. Tomorrow, I will be discussing the strategies for 21st century mission using Nigeria as operational modus. What we have not done many years ago will cost us a lot more to do now. But in case we still want to do the bidding, fulfill the mandate, of the master opportunity still exists for us we can still do mission you never can tell some of the people you win unto the lord will reduce the number of Boko Haram suicide bombers burning down churches some of the people you win over will reduce the number of suicide bombers burning down churches Let's close our eyes for a word of prayer. That song we sang at the beginning says, O Rene, no vio Rene, I o vie, no vie, I vie. Agbadaburu, erumeru, obenota, bororo. Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me big names? And yet, you cannot do the simple thing I've commanded you to do. Is that not hypocrisy? Why do you call me Lord? Is, is he still 
Ogene, Ogene, God above all God, God like no other God, King like no other King. Can we sing that song in greater submission now? Ogene, no Ogene, Ogene, no Ogene, Ogene. We 
have literally lived unto ourselves all by ourselves all for ourselves do you know what it means it means a worshipper of self do you not realize everyone worships their master those who worship self they have self as master who is the person that you are living for oh my god oh my god the greatest crisis of the church is that nobody wants to give of what he has unto the business of the master if people cannot give money that is away from their lives what will the world be like when they are required to give their lives for the master to bow their heads and be slaughtered for this for their faith in their master are we breeding a generation that cannot stand the challenge of faith my father have mercy upon us jehovah have mercy upon us are we truly the backsliding church is it concerning us that the Lord Jesus said, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on earth? Is it about us he is talking? Oh my God, have mercy. Cry unto God this day and ask him to have mercy. Jehovah, have mercy. Forgive all our years of self-centeredness. Forgive, my Father, forgive. Forgive my father, forgive. Forgive my father, forgive. Allah barajon to robo sula kereku. Ela je de rebo sula. Dayaze. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Number three. When are we going to transit? from mission as a ceremonial program to mission as life Abraham was living in awe of the Chaldeans. God said get up from there go and live in this place and evangelize there tell yourself the truth what have you left for the purpose of helping someone to know Jesus do you know as a medical doctor it is possible that God wants you to live in one remote area touching lives with the gospel he said no it's not me no it's not me how can I finish seven years studying medicine and go and live inside the bush it's not me it's not me listen to me we have a very short time to live on this earth very short time Compared to eternity, the time we have on this earth is zero. Can you not invest it on the master's project, knowing that a time is coming when we shall rejoice and celebrate? 